or the ground underneath had been loosened and we were quite frightened that it would actually fall in another quake, which is understandable because the tower is 358 foot high and um, it's about 300 feet from my boundary and of course it's also got long wires and things on it so if men are working up there on the uh, on the tractors it's, it does put them at great risk. So 358 feet, the, the damaged tower was about 358 from your farmland? Yeah. Were, were you worried it might fall? Yes, in, in... I was very worried, yes. Yeah. yes. I wrote to the city council and advised them um, that the only quake harm had occurred only where the area frequency focused when it rocked and tilted. And I asked them to give me the independent engineer's reports to ensure it was safe to continue to transmit when the tower is actually located in an area that they call a high risk. Category A for quake liquefaction is where the tower is actually located in the loop of the river. So it had it was already been badly liquefied, badly damaged, and we had aftershocks. I thought, well, the council will say, look, you know, you can't continue with this damaged tower, it's too risky. And the council told me it was not their responsibility um, to have engineers' reports. So then I wrote to Environment Canterbury, and they told me it was the council's responsibility. And again, the council refused to address this danger. So what did you do when the council refused to help you? Well, in December 2010, I thought, well, who's responsible for um, the reinsurance of the City of Christchurch? And I thought, well, as... Um, we are English speaking and have the, you know, we're Commonwealth countries, it probably would be reinsurance is probably through Lloyds of London. And of course I've been involved, as you know, in the past with Lloyds of London um, many years ago, but um, I wrote to the chief executive who's actually a physicist, Dr. Ward, and um, I thought they might know who carried the radio network insurance and that the possibility of increased harm from their activities. Anyway, Dr. Ward, um, seems to have understood the ongoing risks because within a, a month the FM was actually relocated from Aurora up to Sugarloaf but the car continued to transmit so they'd taken away what seemed to have caused the liquefaction because it was where the FM actually focused that the serious harm had occurred at Carpoy, um, Brooklyn, Spencerville, Belfast, QE2 in the circumference of the tower so that had gone up there whether it had been moved because I also wrote to ECAN or not, all the Lloyds, I don't know, but it did relocate. Did you inform Dr. Ward about your increased radio for frequency allergic reaction, um, the increase the day prior to the quake? And yes, I, I, did t I did tell him that, and I also told him I had written um, with my um, observations, which seemed quite weird about the liquefaction, to UK electromagnetic researcher Dr. Goldsworthy, who'd previously worked for NASA. And his research work shows that radio frequency and microwave, when they're focused onto water, alters the soil and water. And he said that the um, FM focused down to drying could contribute to increased liquefaction. And since then I've spoken to other scientists who have actually worked here in New Zealand and, and they show that um, radio frequency and microwave focused into, into soil and rocks can actually alter the content as well. I also sent Lloyd's the radio network licenses, which showed that the powerful 97 FM, the 97.7 FM was licensed, and this is very unusual, to transmit from both Aruya, which is on the low flat ground, and Sugarloaf, which is up in the hills, and they were instructed never to transmit from both sites at the same time. But when I mapped out where these frequencies actually focused from the licenses, they actually interacted, they collided at exactly where the epicenter was, which I thought was really weird. And everywhere they'd had the most serious harm was where the frequencies were actually colliding. It, it was just the most extraordinary coincidence that where the liquefaction had occurred was only where the FM frequencies were and where these two would have um, connected together was at Darfield, Horata. They were told they were never allowed to transmit at the same time, but there's no one to police it to stop them doing it. And it was in that area that I found the so strong. In 2010, most of the quakes were located southwest of Christchurch City, but your maps show that the only quakes in the 5K vicinity of uh, your tower all occurred where the licenses showed the FM focused. 
Yes, it was really weird. Um, the when I say the maps, the maps I've got are their transmission maps as well as the maps of the area we've got, and there was a continuing pattern of them coinciding. Um, after the Aurora FM relocated back in 2011, went back up into the Sugarloaf Hills, the residents in, in Aurora noted that the local quake stopped completely. And then the pattern of quakes seems to be in circumference of Sugarloaf where the powerful FM focused. Penny, you observed that the days the Sugarloaf FM was powerfully focused in certain directions across the city. The aftershocks increased in that direction. And when you had no RF reaction, there was a time of less aftershocks. Yes, it is actually extraordinary because um, some days I'd have no radio frequency allergic reaction at all when I was driving across the city of my farm or elsewhere. And then another day I would have a very, very strong reaction. And within 24 hours there would be a quake along that particular beam line where I know the frequencies actually focus. I've got the licenses and the transmissions actually showing where the frequencies focus to. Tell me what happened to you the day uh, before the February 22nd quake, the killer quake that took 181 of our Christchurch mm. citizens. Mm. I know, it's quite extraordinary. I've been working with two men at my farm on the morning of the 21st of February and that was the day before the quake. And in the afternoon, I experienced a very extreme radio frequency reaction. And it was the first time I'd actually experienced it at my farm for quite some time. And I had to leave my farm very quickly in a similar manner to having to leave my daughter's place on the 3rd of September, which was close to that epicenter. But this time, the emissions seemed to be focused very powerfully over my land. I can see the difference between AM and FM exposure as with the A in my face goes bright red, my tongue burns, I get dizzy, disorientated, and cannot think straight, and I get very irritable. I actually noticed my men who were working for me started arguing with each other for no reason as well. And I left the farm, and um, I thought, well, I'll just see whether this power is just focused over my farm or whether it's all the way around, because I can actually tell. So I drove the two kilometres circumference around the tower, and my RF reaction only occurred southwest of the tower, so I actually knew it was focused across the city. Okay, so uh, you were at Avonhead when the February 22nd quake hit, and you, obviously you left the farm uh, when you felt sick. So yes, yes I'd, left, I'd left the farm the day before, and I hadn't been back, um, and I was uh, um, over at um, where I'm living at, which is about 10 k's from the tower, and it, it was a very powerful quake, but no serious damage at all, at all in the area. It's very interesting where my farm is is quite close to the airport, and, and um, I don't pick up the frequencies in that area at all, and the airport has had no harm at all. The frequencies go each side of the airport, but where the frequencies don't go, there's no harm, and this is the extraordinary pain. <laughs> All right, folks, we're sorry about that. You you heard that one that time. Uh, they obviously don't like what Penny is saying. Now, Penny, if we can get back to the Christchurch Airport. Uh, well, I've just said about the Christchurch Airport that actually has had no quake damage at all, and it's also in an area where the frequencies actually don't go through. Where the frequencies are actually not directed, we don't seem to have any quake damage at all, and whether it's just a coincidence, I don't know. Anyway, after the quake, I, I went to uh, help my mother in an old people's home and to evacuate some people, and then I went to my farm, and I had a lot of liquefaction at my farm uh, on the February quake, 300 metres southwest of the radio tower, and in a semicircle southwest of the radio tower, where the guide wire actually focuses. And um, I didn't have any real harm on my uh, land near the river or my low wetland. Um, my metal water pipes were broken and my metal wellhead had jumped out of the ground as had previously occurred to the metal sewer pipe lives in Brooklyn and, sewer, and Spencerville and other parts of town only where the frequency focused. Penny, you, you have interesting information from a UK EMR researcher called Dr. Goldberg which explains what happens when metal re interacts with RF, MW, as... Microwave. Microwave, mm -hmm. okay. As might have happened with the sewer lids. Yes. Um, I've had quite a few communications with him, and he explains that when metal and radio frequency microwave interact, it is... Um, he, he says that metals have their own particular emission or frequency spectrum, 
If a radio frequency matches the frequency of the metal, it increases the spin or activity of that metal. The metal's act as magnifiers of electromagnetic frequencies, and it is the same principle that governs the electrical activity of a turbine electrical generator. The faster the turbine turns, the more energy it puts out. The energy matches or is conducted by a metal or an object. It heats up or increases its energy output. Now, of course, the sewer pipes, my well had a lot of water, obviously. It was a big irrigation well, a big one, and it's jumped two feet out of the ground. Um, my metal water pipes, they had water in where they've jumped up and split as well. The metal sewer pipes, which, I mean, they, they jumped some of them up about a metre and a half out of the ground at places like Spencerville and Brooklands and Carpoy in the first quake, not so much in the second quake. And again, it was where the frequencies were interacting with the metal and with the water. And it's all just a whole lot of coincidences that just seem to be rather unusual. So uh, was there uh, other damage in the vicinity of the radio tower, Penny? Yes, there was very specific damage to my immediate neighbours' homes and across the road separating them. There was no damage at all for 5Ks along the road and only at this particular area, which was about... 60 metres across, and it was exactly as if a missile had been fired through an area and the missile had bounced and it was focused directly to where the epicentre of the quake is at Ferry Mead. And it is, it is really extraordinary. The quake rifts actually didn't come from the epicentre direction but from the radio tower. So the land had fallen away uh, towards the radio tower but not as would be expected where the waves came across from the Littleton Ferry Mead epicentre. Was there further damage to the nearby road? There wasn't any damage at all to, to as I just said before, there wasn't any damage um, along the 5k stretch except back where Martians Road actually met um, Lower Sticks Road, which was about 3 k's the other direction, and actually where Martin Gledhill, the National Radiation Laboratory man, had monitored high readings where the waves peaked there in 1999, and that, again, was a, a, a mass of, of, of damage, and that's where the frequency actually focused across um, through Hallswell to Green Park, where there had been a lot of, of quake damage. Hmm. So... Um, and yet another coincidence. They just seem to keep, you know, building up yes. and building up. Was there other quake damage to roads sort of in the 5K circumference of the tower? Or? No, well, this time, again, it was 